Hello, my name is Mary Mack. I'm the Executive Director of ACEDS, the Association of Certified eDiscovery Specialists. And I want to welcome you to this wonderful uh, product service showcase on the ACEDS webinar channel today, uh, sponsored by our, our affiliate Ringtail. And uh, before we get started, as usual, a little bit of housekeeping. You can download the slides right uh, from the council that you're watching the webinar on if, you're, uh, if you are connected and watching in that way. And after the webinar, we'll send out a link to the, um, uh, to the archived uh, version of, the, of this presentation. And we're going to uh, have quite, quite a webinar. So the webinar is titled. We're going to take a look at what Ringtail has in the line of everyday analytics for e-discovery. And before I introduce our presenters, a word about Ringtail. Yeah, so uh, just a little uh, housekeeping item here. My name is Jeff Brazlin. I do product marketing with Ringtail. And in case you haven't heard some exciting news yesterday, Nuix acquired Ringtail. And, and with that is creating the leading end-to-end -end integrated e-discovery platform. So very exciting. If you'd like to learn more about that, there's uh, the press releases on ringtail.com as well as nuix.com. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And our Speaker to, speakers today, including Jeff, who I'll introduce in just a quick second, we have Caroline Sweeney. Caroline Sweeney, uh, many of you in the ASEDS community are quite familiar with Caroline. She is our uh, chapter president in the, in the Twin Cities. Caroline is the director of knowledge management and innovation at Dorsey & Whitney. And she is, I would say, ubiquitous on the conference uh, circuit. She is the go-to person in our community for, for leading edge um, uh, technology and also uh, process and how to bring it into uh, a law firm in a way that uh, partners and the legal folk uh, can easily adapt. I think, Caroline, you, uh, <laughs> you are one of a handful of, of people who are able to wear that innovation uh, title and actually have uh, uh, systems that are that are implemented. We also have with us, so welcome uh, once again, Caroline. We have Emily Tice, who will be running the keyboard for this uh, demonstration. And she is the Senior Managing Director at Ringtail. And she uh, leads the customer success team and has hands-on experience in some of the most complex litigation uh, that can um, uh, that can arise, everything from banking and automotive and pharmaceutical, some of the ones that have financial, that have some of those very, very strict requirements. And so we're very interested in, um, in what Emily, how Emily will be uh, demonstrating uh, the platform. We also have Jeff, who you heard earlier with that fabulous announcement that dropped yesterday. Uh, Jeff Braislin, he is the Senior Manager of Product Marketing for Ringtail. And uh, he, is, he has been focused in building uh, great products for years, and he's bringing his expertise to the e-discovery community. And I'm delighted to welcome back these three presenters for a, uh, uh, for a deep dive through the analytics uh, capabilities of Ringtail. Thank you. Yep. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Mary. So uh, as Mary mentioned, we're really lucky today to have some great speakers with us, specifically Caroline, who really has been a leading innovator in adopting of analytics and really implementing analytics in the legal world. Um, so she's going to be walking us through a lot of her best practices, what she's done to implement uh, and apply analytics um, to the benefit of her legal team and, and their clients as well. And Emily's going to show us examples of analytics in action while she does that. So, so it'll be certainly rich content. Um, but, but to start with, we're going to kind of lay the foundation for today. And we're going to talk a little bit about defining analytics um, because it can cover a lot of ground and just get a little bit more specific. And then we're going to talk about what the current state of adoption of analytics are in the legal space. 
And then we're going to hand it over, as I mentioned, to Caroline that's going to talk about, you know, some ways that you can implement analytics as part of your legal team. This is some practical information that you can walk away with and apply. And then when to use what analytics. Um, and you're going to see that live. And then we're going to talk about the practical tips for actually using it as well, too. So um, lots to get to today. With that said, let's, um, let's dive in. Um, so when talking about analytics, I think most people are familiar with analytics, right? Uh, at the most basic of levels, it's the discovery, interpretation, and communication of meaningful patterns and data. And really, you use this information to um, not only measure but optimize, to make things better, to improve, um, to achieve a desired outcome. And when we get into the e-discovery space, there's really kind of what I'll call the, the three core food groups of analytics. There's predictive analytics, which are things like predictive coding and continuous active learning. And then there's structured analytics, which is, are things like duplication detection and email threading. And then conceptual analytics like concept clustering, word cloud, and keyword analysts, where you're really getting this visual summary of the data at its core, such as the review dashboard you see at the bottom of the screen there. Another example of this, just to kind of illustrate, is what we call timeline functionality, which is the ability to view uh, document distribution over time. And you can use these tools. They're interactive to refine your data set, to narrow the focus, and get more specific. Um, let's just say you know something occurred on a, on a certain date. You can then narrow that, um, that window of time to, spoke, to focus on the document specifically within that, too. Um, sometimes it's great for early cases assessment. Other times it's just really great to be able to have the, that level of control of viewing your data. So in talking about analytics, this is a term that gets thrown out quite a bit, but the notion of AI, artificial intelligence, but more specifically under the umbrella of AI in, in, in our context today, we're talking about machine learning. And there's two key buckets of that. There's supervised machine learning, which is really reproducing known knowledge through an algorithm that's, making, that's learning and making decisions like a human would. And then there's unsupervised machine learning, which is often uh, data mining, which is summarizing the content of document sets and then organizing organizing them away based on similarities um, that are people more e are, are able to more easily grasp based on that organization. And so you're going to see examples of that today. You're going to see that live. And so I just wanted to kind of illustrate what exactly is you will be seeing. And so along those lines, this is an example of continuous active learning, but it's, it's really the, the review decisions that are being made by the review team are being fed back into the review system to optimize it, as opposed to what people often call TAR 1.0, where a subject matter expert is making the, the training decision. So you'll see that today, and you'll, you'll also hear some case study data from Caroline of how that's been applied. And then what we call in Ringtail, which is, which is document mapper or concept clustering, right, this is an example of, of really kind of organizing data, which is called, you know, unsupervised machine learning that allows people to organize the document sets, sets based on shared concepts, um, nouns, phrases, and then grouping them in a way that makes sense, right? So at a glance, you now have your arms around um, a very large data set. And this, this notion that a picture says a thousand words, you are able to understand the contents of a document sent from the get-go. So very powerful, especially when you're getting into the large document sets where you're not quite sure what you're dealing with. It gives you a really good understanding out the gate. So which brings us to the point of, of where, where do we sit today in terms of analytics adoption, right? I think more and more we're seeing people turn to analytics because of, of how complex data sets are becoming, the data volumes, but adoption isn't quite where it, where it could or should be. Um, in a survey that Ringtail conducted with EMC Research uh, in April of this year, we found that only 50% of legal professionals report using analytics less than a few times a year. And one of the reasons we're talking about um, analytics today and this notion of everyday analytics is because some people think of analytics as, oh, only when, you know, a very complex matter or, or maybe sometimes it's only considered as part of predictive coding and continuous active learning. The reality is you're probably using a form of analytics today already. Um, with that said, there's certainly more that can be done with analytics. So we're going we're gonna to cover that today and, and, and hope to get people more comfortable with the notion of analytics and using analytics as well. So when we get into analytics, we also ask the question of, of, of usage of specific analytics. So with predictive coding, um, our survey found that 54% of legal professionals are using that regularly or semi-regularly. 
with content analytics such as uh, concept clustering or document mapper, we're finding that 53% of legal teams are reporting um, using that regularly or semi-regularly. And then with regards to social network analytics, we're finding that only 10% of legal professionals are using that regularly or semi-regularly. So while people are using it, they're certainly not embracing it as much as they can be. And I think there's some really easy ways to, to make it a part of the everyday uh, mix in terms of review process, and you're going to see that today. So what are some of the reasons we often hear um, why, why legal teams haven't fully adopted analytics in the ways that they can? Some are concerned with change. They've always done it a certain way. Asking them to do something different is hard. Some aren't certain about the defensibility of the analytics in court. And some actually don't quite grasp. They maybe already are using analytics, right? Maybe they just need to expand their definition and understand that, oh, actually, I am using that. And oftentimes, when people understand that they are using something, <clears throat> they'll take the next step and start using it more. Sometimes there's perceived difficulty of use. And, and oftentimes there can be actual difficulty of use, and that's a big deal for software products to make sure, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but to make sure that they're making analytics easy, easy to use, easy to apply, easy to understand, making sure that they're accessible. So, so why should legal teams care about analytics? Well, there's a lot of advantages that can be gained from using analytics, especially in today's environment. So it allows you the ability to conduct um, early case assessment effectively. To, as I mentioned before, you can, you can gain an informed case strategy from the onset of a matter. You can narrow the data focus to reduce hosted data and associated costs. Um, you can also develop a deeper understanding of the data. Um, it also gives you the ability to more, more um, efficiently review the data, getting from point A to point B faster. Um, it also ensures the quality of review, using the analytics for quality control, making sure that review decisions are being applied correctly, making sure there are, are no things mis, uh, mislabeled, mistagged. And you're going to see that today as well. So for the folks thinking about applying analytics, um, really understanding you know, their software that they currently have today, this is what you should be asking of uh, your software provider, whether it's your current or if you're looking for one. You should make sure that the analytics in your eDiscovery platform are easy to access. Make sure that, that your platform is uh, using customer-centric design where you're not having to use 10 clicks to get from point A to point, to point B. And they should be easy to use, right? Um, easy to apply. It shouldn't require a, a math degree to deploy continuous active learning. And then easy to learn. Um, there should be resources available uh, for yourself, as well as as you onboard uh, new people to your team to ramp them up on analytics, best practices, tips and tricks, um, as well as learning management systems are all great resources for bringing people up to speed. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Caroline, and um, she's going to share with, a lot of, uh, with us a lot of uh, what she's done with analytics and a lot of her best practices. Great. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to my friends at ACES and to Ringtail for hosting uh, today's webinar. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I'm, um, I'm pleased to be able to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about it and how we're leveraging uh, the analytic tools in our Ringtail platform. Um, just to give folks a little bit of background, uh, Dorothy has been a Ringtail shop, if you will, since roughly 2008 when we um, moved to replace summation that we had previously uh, managed in-house. And we originally started our Ringtail implementation on-premise, that is behind our firewall, and then um, became, when, when um, Ringtail, FTI Ringtail introduced the SaaS environment, we became among the first, if not the first, um, client to move into the, the SaaS environment, and that has proved to be proven to be a very successful um, move for us. You know, no longer am I competing with uh, the office upgrade um, or PC refresh projects to do a ringtail um, refresh. We're constantly um, able to get the most recent versions and, and um, new feature sets available in ringtail as they're made available and it's not a, a, a big internal IS project. So the SAS move has been very positive for us. Um, our environment, um, we average, right now we have about 270 databases. We typically manage around 250 users, that's both internal users 
and external client users, experts, co-counsel, et cetera. Um, our databases range anywhere from really under a gig of data to uh, well over six terabytes of data. And as part of our ISO 27001 certification, we're really pushing people to move, um, move discovery documents into the Ringtail platform out of you know, file servers and, and what have you. So um, we're seeing an increased adoption of, I would say, of our um, Ringtail platform and, um, and engagement by users in, in using the platform. We use it for investigations, with regulatory reviews, and litigation, and other um, uh, applications as well. As I mentioned, we're, we heavily leverage analytics, and one of the things that we really appreciate about Ringtail that we have not experienced in some of the other platforms that we've used is that the analytics is integrated into the Ringtail platform. So um, to Jeff's point, it's very accessible, and we're able to use different analytic tools throughout the life cycle of a case. So um, for us, really, analytics is, is part of our standard operating procedure. And what I'd like to do is um, start to walk you through how we use it every day, from ingestions to um, production and, and more. So starting with um, ingestions, uh, deduplication. Um, and you can see here, Emily is showing that we have various options for deduplication, um, including a global deduplication, which for us is our standard practice. And one of the things we appreciate about that is that in selecting global deduplication, it's autom Ringtail will automatically populate an all custodian field as well as all path field. And so that um, is very helpful, uh, obviously, to us in tracking what it is we've received and not losing that information from other other custodians. We also use um, or have available the within custodian. And sometimes um, the none, uh, the option to choose no deduplication. In fact, that might come in handy when, say, you know, at the beginning of the case, somebody sends you some really key documents. And then later on, we do a, a uh, what do I want to say, a, a complete collection for a particular custodian and we don't want to dedupe against what was previously received, and so we might set to none for in that situation. But the nice thing here is that there is some flexibility to toggle between um, those different uh, deduplication require or, or instructions. So um, that is probably the, the first example of uh, analytics that we employ on a typical case. Um, you can also see here on the screen that Emily is showing that we have the ability to apply date ranges here, to exclude NIST, NIST files, to set our um, time zone, um, to exclude certain categories or uh, document types from processing if appropriate. Um, we also typically will, um, as part of our standard pr procedure, um, keep foreign language or have identified language set, um, we're seeing increasingly um, foreign language content in our document collections. In fact, we have four um, document reviews going on right now in our Legal Mind facility where we're um, doing Greek review, Mongolian language review, Spanish language review, and French um, language review. So this can be, um, we, we keep that on as a standard so that um, we're able to appropriately staff or, or leverage other tools within Ringtail to manage that foreign language content. Um, the other thing that we also leave on by default is the identify um, personal information, so it's flagging for us um, certain PII in the, in the document. Um, Emily, anything you want to add here on the foreign language or in uh, the yeah. whole processing setting? Uh, no, I think that's great. I think this last one here is what you mentioned, the ability to have those all custodian and all file paths fields um, that are really valuable. Yes, mm -hmm. they really are. And then once um, a document set has gone through the ingestions process, we're using um, the Ringtail's ingest, uh, ingestions report to help us do some standard QC on the document. So you can see here 
um, that this is telling us you know, that we process these files for Vince Kaminsky. Um, this is the contents. These are um, the, the processing settings, number of files that were generated, et cetera, and we're able to, to do some initial QC and then also um, look at if there's any um, problem um, files. For example, um, you can see there's 11 files where the export failed. Um, it also lets us see we've got some multimedia files in here, so how do we want to handle those? Um, you'll notice there's non-searchable PDF. We have a standard process where those files are immediately submitted for um, OCR and text extraction, so that or OCR, so that um, we have text that we can um, then leverage later on in the uh, in the review phase. Also, this report tells you the number of suppressed and unsuppressed documents um, within the collection and how many duplicates yeah. we had. Sure. And if you want, you can get a little more detail on this report screen as well on those those various file types that fell into those categories of duplicates and suppressed. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So once we've gone through um, ingestions, and the way we've structured our e-discovery team is that we have specialists that kind of um, step in at the various phases of the review workflow. So from ingestions and the ingestions QC, um, we then push the, the data to our early data assessment team. And there, they start to do some an analysis around what it is we have so that we can um, best educate the legal team about um, how, you know, exactly that, I guess, what, what it is we have and how we might approach the, the review and how we might narrow um, our, our review universe. So one of the first things that we'll do um, is a timeline or a gap analysis, looking at um, are we seeing gaps in um, the data collection with respect to the, the time frame at issue? And does that mean that we need to go back and potentially recollect, or at least we have to go back and, and understand um, why it is we have gaps in a particular time frame? So for example, you'll see there, um, Bill Rapp doesn't have, or Albert Myers either, don't have documents for a very early period in the collection. Um, Bill Rapp is here missing documents from May to, to July. Why is that? Was there an issue with the collection? Did he just not have documents? Um, was he on some sort of leave and therefore didn't have documents to collect? So understanding all of that and being able to explain those gaps in the collection is is very helpful. Another tool that is probably one of my favorites is, oh, one thing before I jump off of this, one thing um, to mention is you'll, this is called a cube report essentially within Ringtail. And you'll notice that um, Emily has highlighted that uh, line of documents there. Uh, each of those numbers is is a hyperlink. So if I want to go look at the seven documents Vince Kaminsky has in June, I can click on that hyperlink and then go to those documents. Um, so it's just a, an easy way to navigate within the population as well. Anything to add there, Emily, before I jump on to the next item? Um, no, I'm just pointing out another gap, as you pointed out before. Vince has a lot of data. Um, and then all of a sudden he doesn't, and then he does again. So a nice example of a gap, but great point. Yep, great. Um, so one of my favorite tools in, in Ringtail is the social network analysis. Um, and you can use this in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, uh, maybe you have a case where you're trying to determine did the individual, um, before he left the company, send proprietary information to his personal account or share it with um, other potential um, individuals at his, his new company. And so using something like um, the social network analysis can help you quickly hone in on those documents 
and um, select them to put into your review workflow if that's where you really want to concentrate um, you know, your analysis. Uh, we've also used it in investigations. In fact, we had recently an investigation where um, there was an individual whose name we knew, but we didn't understand at all what his role was within the organization. And so we started off by seeing who was he communicating within the company so that we could start to build um, our understanding of what his role was in the, in the investigation or in the organization. Um, we've also used this to do some domain analysis. Um, before I get to there, I guess a good point here that Emily is showing is um, the number of emails that are sent and received um, between particular individuals can be displayed as you hover um, over. So, so here we see this um, between Vince and Lou Zimmon. Um, the number of emails that were going back and forth. So, and I'll show here um, in the browse pane for a moment, I'll just show those domains, for example, that Caroline mentioned. So you can see, oh, there are a lot of emails in this case that have the AOL domain, for example. Exactly. And so this is another good area where, again, you can either um, identify by checking the boxes on the left documents that you want to include in your population, or you can exclude, or conversely, you can exclude documents. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a good uh, situation where um, if for some reason the, the fantasy baseball emails have made it into, into your population and you want to exclude them, you can do that here. I do caution, however, um, at one point, we did have a review where uh, insider trading was being covered up by those fantasy sports emails. So you might also want to investigate um, those a little bit to make sure you're not um, making an assumption before excluding them from the review completely. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, we are really, in fact, we have a team right now that's meeting um, talking about um, how to use the social network analysis to understand what individuals were talking about particular issues in an investigation. So by issue coding our documents, putting them into a binder, and then submitting them um, through the social, taking the social network perspective, we can see exactly who was talking with whom about um, the, these particular issues and start to drill down to get more granular in our analysis of, of, of those um, particular topics. Another uh, tool that we use in our early data assessment um, report package is the, doc, is the document type analysis. Um, and again, we leverage the CUBE report to look at those various document types and make special, you know, determine if we need to make some special accommodations based on that. So do we need special software because we have a construction case and we have some unique um, uh, engineering or construction files that, that we need to view? Um, are there certain file types that are better reviewed outside of Ringtail? Um, do we have audio files and therefore we have a, um, do we have a, a different workflow that we need to develop? So understanding the different file types in the collection can be very um, helpful as well. And Emily is showing you um, the list here on the left-hand side of the screen that tells us um, the, the file types and the types of um, mm -hmm. or the specific documents, I should say. Um, I also mentioned earlier that during the ingestion phase, we're flagging for foreign language content. Um, and again, once we process the documents into Ringtail, we're able to look for what foreign language content do we have in this collection. And um, what Ringtail will do is 51% and above is where uh, a foreign language is flagged as the primary language for the document. Um, and then it will list also some of the other languages. So, this allows us to determine, okay, are we going to leverage machine translation? And can we take all of those Polish documents, 
put them in a binder and within Ringtail submit them for machine translation? Or do we need to um, bring in native Polish language speakers to conduct document review? So um, very helpful in, in helping you strategize um, about what sort of foreign language support you might need and then determining if, if machine translation or um, actual native reviewers is, are going to be required or a combination of both actually. So once our um, early data assessment team has kind of gone through and done the basic reporting and shared that with the legal team, typically what we start to get into is the actual search term vetting. And, and I don't know about other firms, but we still, um, I would say, rely heavily on, on search terms, even when using, um, which I'll talk about in a while, even when using tools like um, continuous active learning. So one of the things that we've really started to work with more and more frequently is the concept cloud. And so basically you can generate a list of all of the concepts, the key concepts in your document collection. Um, another thing that we have done is uploaded um, the complaint, the answer, and interrogatory requests so that um, we start to see what terminology is, is, is uh, found in, in those documents to help us determine what are appropriate search terms. And you can see that there's a, a slide across the top of the screen that allows you to go from here's the, the broad world of all of the search terms and then you can start to narrow down to um, more, uh, I guess I would say more narrow concepts. Um, some of the cool things about this word cloud, obviously you're probably familiar with these, but the bigger the word, the more prevalent the term. You can also click on the term um, and then jump to the documents that have, for example, cash as a key concept. So we have found this to be um, helpful in, in coming up with search terms. We've also found it helpful um, in helping us narrow search terms. So we've run a set of search terms. We have um, a large uh, return on particular terms. And so maybe we'll run the word cloud on that set of documents to understand are there additional terms that we could be using to, to narrow um, that particular search term. Like, um, then we've even had just recently, I mentioned this is starting to catch on, and we just recently had um, an attorney ask, oh, can I use the word cloud to kind of figure out how to, to narrow the scope of a couple of these terms? So um, I think it's, it's catching on with people. Uh, the search term hit reports, I think that's something that everybody is used to generating and used to, to looking at. And we certainly um, can provide that within Ringtail. Um, and, and we'll do that again. Let Emily here generate the search term hit report for you. So you can see um, the, the number of documents, the number of document or full family count um, for those search terms, how many unique documents are being returned by a particular term and unique families. Um, Again, these are hyperlinks, so you can click on the hyperlink and jump to the, doc, the 244 family documents that reference the search term system. Um, another tool, and, and this is obviously, this is standard and heavily used, um, but I like to encourage some of the other um, tools like the Word Cloud, um, some of the other reports that you can generate and, uh, and and also encourage people to click on these hyperlinks and go in and look at some of these documents and not just look at the number and say, oh, we've got to reduce the number of documents that hit on the word risk. How do, and, and then the more informed they can be about how to narrow that term, um, the better off I think everybody is and, and this makes it very easy to do that. Another um, technique that we've used is 
doing some sampling and analysis of responsive, non-responsive um, uh, calls for particular search terms to help us with a burden analysis. Um, I was actually pulling together some materials for an upcoming presentation the other day, and I came across a recent case, I want to say it was from July, where um, the parties were negotiating their ESI protocol, and the receiving party wanted, okay, we'll agree to these search terms for now, but when the review is over and you've produced everything to us, we want you to sample that, that null set that didn't hit on any search terms, see if there's anything there that's responsive, and then maybe we'll amend the search terms at that point. I thought that was kind of an interesting case because I'm not sure why you would push that out to the end of the process. I would rather do some of that search term vetting up front. And so a lot of times what we'll do um, either, there's a search term that's returning um, a, a large number of hits and we want to refine it and maybe we're having some pushback with the other side. And so we'll take a random sample of those documents and that's what this chart is representing here. And we're able to see, you know, um, for example, on the word system, um, we're able to see how many documents are actually being um, identified as positive versus negative um, and, and do, or non-responsive, and do we want to um, try to push back on the burden of re reviewing or using a term um, that is going to be uh, bringing back a lot of false positives versus a term that is going to be more narrowly um, and appropriately focused for purposes of the review. Um, you can also, at this point, when you're still developing your search terms, do your random sample of um, the documents that don't hit on search terms to see if there's a search term that maybe you're, you're missing um, or that, that you should be applying to, to return potentially relevant documents. And you can use a similar yeah. type of here. Yeah, and this ahead. link here, for example, the 644 here would tell you here are all the documents in your sample that are that are, you're turning up to find relevant, but that don't have any of your terms. So that'd be a great way to jump to those. Exactly. So another report that we'll typically run too is a search term overlap report. And again, it's leveraging um, the cube reporting functionality within Ringtail. Um, and, and what that does is it allows us to see, you know, visually how many documents or what search terms are returning unique documents um, and what search terms are maybe terms that we can eliminate because they're being pulled in by other terms. Those same documents are being pulled in by other terms. One of the things that's really cool about the cube functionality in Ringtail is that we can use any fielded data to generate these types of reports. So something else we might do is look at search terms by custodian, um, where you have the search terms on, on the left-hand side in your column and you have your custodians across the top, and you can see what terms are, um, you know, mm -hmm. how heavily they're hitting within certain custodians. Um, I'm looking here if there's a good example, but you can see, for example, um, the COB term it brings in 320 or has 321 hits, um, and then or 64 documents that hit on COB are also hitting on congestion. Um, so it gives you a, a, an idea of where that overlap is, and that has sometimes been effective in helping us um, vet and, and modify. Uh, appropriately search terms. Mm -hmm. So anything, Emily, you'd like to add before I move on to the review phase? No, I, th I think your point was spot on. You know, if you're going to maybe spend time and capital negotiating a particular um, term, it's important to know if, if that, that change to that term or the removal of that term will have any effect at all. You know, uh, so if, if most of those terms if the, most of the 321 from COB are encompassed in energy, you know, getting rid of COB may not have the impact you want. So just helpful for that reason. Uh, I think you made the point well. Um, and I guess one other thing that um, with respect to the word cloud analysis, one thing I think that can help you do too is um, 
see, you know, if there's odd terminology that's showing up in the documents and you're sort of curious as what does this, why is this word in, in our collection, what does this mean, you can then jump from the word cloud to the documents with that concept and then start to um, evaluate the import of that word. So, mm -hmm. so yep. on to re review. So let's say we've, we've gone through this process, we've worked with the legal team, we've gotten our um, set of search terms, and now we're getting ready to set up our document review. And again, of course, this is where we leverage a number of the Ringtail analytic, analytic tools. Um, the first one, however, predictive coding 1.0 or, or traditional predictive coding um, is one where we would typically not um, be writing search terms first. Um, in fact, we just went through a rather lengthy negotiation where um, our option was to run search terms and re return um, or, and turn over any documents that hit on search terms minus those that hit on privilege terms or use predictive coding um, without any um, search term limitations. We did some initial sampling um, and we used that um, chart I was showing about the um, sampling and then the analysis of responsive and non-responsive and realized that um, in using search terms, we would be, with no further review, we would be turning over a tremendous amount of non-responsive content. And so we made the decision to go the predictive coding route where we're able to hopefully minimize um, the volume of non-responsive documents that we're gonna be producing. So um, within, I will say that we don't use the traditional predictive coding option as frequently as we are leveraging the CAL, Continuous Active Learning. Um, I think this is because in our experience, we, um, we tend to have rolling collection of data um, and predictive, the predictive coding 1.0, I would say, um, works better when you have everything collected um, so that you're not having to retrain as you're adding new, um, uh, new documents to your collection. Um, it also takes a bit more planning and a bit more negotiation in our experience. Um, so I, I would say that while we're using it on occasion, we um, have not embraced it as um, generously as we have um, continuous active learning. Um, what Emily, you know, typically at a very high level, you identify your seed set, you identify a comparison set which allows you to assess the quality of your training. You create a predictive not model. You tell it what's, you know, what is your positive and what are your negative values. You score um, and then you're able to, using tools such as this report here within Ringtail, you can evaluate the different training sets um, and determine which um, Predictive model you want to you want to go with. Go ahead. Sorry, I jumped and, ahead. So, um, yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go back a moment. So, Car Caroline was making the point there that, um, and I think it's a good one to point out that what we've done here is we've first built a model with about 500 training documents, and um, while we thought that was helpful and it gave us projected positives, we said let's increase that. We we trained on 500 more. Uh, the precision increased, and then we did it again to expand the, the set again. So you can see that that is improving the model, and then we can take a look at compared to that comparison sample, which is kept separate so that we can evaluate the uh, performance. Um, then we're able to take a look at uh, how documents are scored and, and what uh, combinations of recall and precision are available. So that's what this screen is about, allowing you to decide, wow, if I take this, score here and I say I'm interested in considering everything above this score, the uh, negative 257, then I can achieve recall of around this percent with precision of about this. And again, we kind of like how the interactive slide here, the uh, or slider there at the top that helps us in, in conducting the analysis of when um, you know what where we want to be and, and mm -hmm. when we 
stop training, et cetera. Absolutely. As I mentioned, however, yeah, as I mentioned, however, um, we have really embraced the continuous active learning model, and that has become kind of our standard operating procedure um, on most reviews, if nothing else, um, on, on outgoing production, helping us to prioritize documents. And so um, basically what we do here is we start with a random sample, we code the documents, we build um, the, the, the CAL model. Um, it, what it will do from our training set is it will go out and take everything else that's in the potential review population and score it again on that negative one to positive one basis. And then come back and you can see in this report it's telling us at a 95% confidence level, um, you're probably going to see somewhere between 5,100 and 7,300 responsive documents in this population. We always then multiply that by three, so we say, okay, we're going to have to probably review somewhere between 15,000 and 21,000, 22,000 documents, um, and then you'll see it, it gives you your recall and, and precision. We set this to run on a regular basis, so each Typically, we run it on a daily basis. So each day, we're basically percolating to the top those documents that are most likely to be relevant um, and those documents that are least likely to be relevant. And in some situations, we've even stopped the review when we're primarily returning um, non-responsive documents. Um, you can also build these, these CAL models. Um, against more than just relevant and non-relevant. So we've used it with issue codes. Um, we've on occasion used it with privileged documents. Um, we've used it, or we plan to use it in conjunction with um, uh, the traditional predictive coding model because then once we've identified out of the, the responsive documents that TAR 1.0 has, has identified for us, we need to pull out the privileged documents for review and we'll use CAL to help us prioritize that privilege review. So um, very powerful. Uh, we, um, we've also used it with foreign language content. Um, in fact, interestingly, uh, it's been helpful to us in identifying Mongolian language content in documents, um, which is not a language that um, some of the language packs identify during uh, processing, so that's been um, also very helpful to us. So tons of different uses, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but um, I can't speak highly enough about the use of continuous active learning and how I really think it has driven um, a greater adoption of, of ringtail analytics at our firm. Interestingly, we mm -hmm. worked on, on another case which was not hosted in ringtail for a client, and um, that vendor was introducing continuous active learning, and we were able to train them basically on the workflow for their product on how to um, manage continuous active learning. So I do think Ringtail is ahead of the um, game here. Another uh, tool we frequently use is email threading. Um, and uh, again, that... Um, couple things you need to think about there. First of all, if that's something that the team wants to use, have they negotiated that as part of the ESI protocol um, so that you can safely uh, include only, um, you know, the most complete email threads and any pivots within the, the email thread and set aside uh, documents that, um, that in that thread that are assumed in, 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 the other, in those other pivots. Um, Ringtail identifies as a pivot document in an email thread um, any email where a new person is introduced or dropped or a new attachment or attachments are added. So those all get fed into review um, and the other documents get left aside. If you decide at the last minute, oh, let's use email threading to cut down on what we need to review, then you need to build into your workflow on the back end how you're going to repopulate um, those threads um, for your production set if you can't get agreement on excluding them otherwise. Um, but it certainly helps, 
excuse me, helps not just to reduce uh, document volume for review, but ensuring greater consistency both with respect to redactions and with respect to uh, privilege calls. Mm -hmm. Another um, functionality that we're starting to use is the compare function. And again, another um, relatively new but pretty cool, I think, um, feature within Ringtail where you can compare um, multiple documents. So you, you um, designate your primary document, and then you can scroll through a list of documents and show um, the changes between the two. So you can see here on the left-hand side, we have our, I don't know, primary document, I guess that's what I'm calling it. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, the changes that were introduced um, in, the, in a subsequent document. And the comparison, if I recall, Emily, it also um, tells you how, how, what the percentage of similarity is between the two documents. It will, it will definitely um, help you move. So I just have one example here because this is an email thread where somebody replied back. But it will actually right. group and let you move through those as well. And if I'm right. here um, in the related pane, um, I can see, for example, this is my first document. And then um, this one here, the next document, is uh, 89, almost 90% conceptually similar to that. Exactly. Um, another feature that we use very heavily um, is, our, is the visual concept clustering. And this is something we repeatedly actually, probably on an annual basis, I guess I should say, um, survey our, review mem our re contract review attorneys um, as to their um, preferred review platform. And Ringtail typically comes out on top because of the, in, in large part, because of the um, visual clustering, and it's interesting to see how different review attorneys approach document review with the, the concept map. Some will go in and immediately identify where the, what they think are kind of like the junk documents and try to um, review those quickly and move those out of their concept map. So in this example, um, I see like uh, resumes, a uh, bunch mm -hmm. of documents there, maybe those aren't tips you know, particularly relevant, people will go in, quickly review those, and then you can sweep that concept um, off of your map and then hone in on, on further hone in on, on the relevant concepts. Um, other people will go in and they'll say, oh, power, that's a really important term um, within this collection. I want to look at those documents first, and they'll narrow in on um, the 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 documents with that concept. Um, we also use the, the mapping at times for um, review quality control. So we can see, and we do this too um, at production, but we can see, for example, um, clusters where uh, there's a mix of responsive and, and privileged documents. And so do we want to go in and, and um, make sure that we're accurately capturing the privilege calls in that, in that particular cluster of documents. We also heavily leverage CAL for um, review quality control. So I mentioned that um, the continuous active learning platform is scoring documents anywhere from negative one to positive one. And any time that CAL says, oh, this document should be responsive or non-responsive, and the reviewer makes the opposite call, we will send those documents those conflict documents onto a second level review as part of our QC process. Another thing Emily is showing here is the ability to use the timeline, and, and we do have reviewers that will do that as well, um, but go in and look at particular time frames and then look at the documents within that, that time frame. So they're really able to customize, um, I think, their review workflow within their review batch in a way that um, helps them to be most efficient during the review process. Um, Ringtail also offers um, some review metrics, a dashboard, and this can be very helpful um, where you can quickly go in and get a handle on how many responsive documents, how many privileged documents, non-responsive content are, is there in the collection. 
Um, you can look at, um, and this is a demo, so it's not you know, necessarily the greatest illustration, but you can look at your review team and you can see, oh, J.R. Jenkins is identifying all of his documents as rele relevant and privileged. Um, do we need to spot check and make sure he's doing so correctly? Do we want to talk to him and find out you know, what were you reviewing or why so much um, relevant privilege? Um, so it can kind of help you with managing your review overall. And you can see that it's, um, it gives you some other stats in terms of estimating how much longer um, will be required for your review, how many documents are being coded per hour, et cetera. Um, my understanding, too, is there are more dashboards um, coming, so we'll have some different um, dashboard functionality coming in, in the coming months. Another really I'll neat feature. I'll give you a peek at that, uh, Caroline, real quick. Um, here are some examples of, of dashboards that will be coming soon. Great. You can take, yep. Go ahead. Uh, another really um, cool feature, I think, within Ringtail is the abil ability to handle audio content. And again, um, this is something that we're starting to see more and more of, like the foreign language. Not quite as prevalent, but we're seeing more and more of it. Um, and so within Ringtail, to take your um, multimedia or your audio files and being able to submit those to, um, to be automatically or, or transcribed um, and then to be able to leverage the other, the analytic tools, the search functionality, et cetera, um, to identify relevant content within the audio files. This is a huge... Um, in our experience, a huge um, asset to helping drive down the time spent reviewing audio content and to really integrating that with the rest of your document review population. Um, once we've gone through the review process, and I know we're, we're getting toward the end here, we've been talking too much, um, we'll, we move <laughs> our, our production team and there we'll do um, some additional uh, quality control and leverage the analytic tools again. Um, again, we'll use the document map. Um, and we'll start, we'll take our set of documents that have been identified as privileged or potentially privileged, and we will map them with the document set that is going out the door for production. So typically, green is going out the door for production, red is being withheld for privileged purpose, purposes. And we'll see, are there any clusters where there's a mixture of red and green? And do we want to go in and look at some of those clusters to make sure that um, we're avoiding an inadvertent um, privilege production? We've done the same thing with redaction, where we put the documents, uh, and you can see there's a red and green um, cluster there on the, on the screen. And so that's a cluster we probably want to go in and look at and just make sure that we're okay with um, the documents in that set that are identified for, for production to be produced. Um, and as I was mentioning, we've also done this with redactions where we set a, a color for redactions mm -hmm. and we um, to make sure that do we have a bunch of redacted documents in a cluster and uh, documents that are going out unredacted and do we need to double check those. Um, I wanted to throw in, um, we were actually planning a, a, a workshop that we're going to be doing with our users in a few weeks around um, using Ringtail for witness kits. And again, you can leverage many of the analytic tools that we've been talking about, the email threading, um, the ability to dedupe documents manually within Ringtail um, to really you know, get away from the box of documents that are become the witness kit, to really taking a more strategic approach in developing a witness kit. You can um, potentially take key documents in your collection and use the find similar um, functionality within Ringtail to find similar key documents that we might want to um, include in the collection or in the witness kit. Um, you might want to use the social network for a particular deponent and, and identify documents by a social network to include in your witness kit. So um, again, the the as I said, the analytics can really help you be more strategic in assembling a witness kit. 
One last thing I wanted to show are the ringtail data models. And again, uh, a relatively um, new functionality within ringtail this year. Um, we are using the ringtail data models to build out um, our collection tracking so that we are able to more effectively collaborate and be transparent around um, the custodians that we've and da evidence data that we've received from four particular custodians and where it is in our process from um, ingestion to review uh, or production, where it's stored, et cetera. Um, there's a number of different uses with data models and we're also looking at using it for um, uh, developing chronologies. We're exploring the possibility of how we might build out some legal hold tracking on a database level um, that could be maintained within the, the Ringtail database so that all of that information is available um, to the legal team in one um, secure location. And Emily's just and I'll just. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just to underline what Caroline said. Um, so here, for example, instead of tracking documents, I'm tracking some evidence that's come in. So I've added a record for each of the PST files, for example, that I want to process for this custodian. And I'm able to keep track of what kind of email that might be, the state of the collection, um, you know, anything like that, the date range, even going so far as if I want to con uh, include the file size and count. And as Caroline, uh, you know, made a good, uh, gave good examples of, this is just one thing. You can certainly track, you know, uh, individuals and, and their parts in particular, uh, you know, in the, in the litigation or the investigation. What's their profile? When did they work there? What, what projects were they a part of? Um, what, how do they tie into particular events? Any, any kind of record um, can be added and then connected to other items including original documents, uh, you know, the core thing that Ringtail does. But the idea is there just to track anything that's important to you also in the database. So with that, I, we're, I think, two minutes over. So there is in the um, slide deck a couple of case studies showing how we have used in a, both in an incoming production um, and an outgoing production um, the various analytic tools to drive down um, the, the cost of, of document review for our clients. And so certainly happy to answer questions offline if people have any questions on that. Apologies for going a couple minutes over, but hopefully we gave you a good sense of um, what's available to you within the Ringtail platform. Well, uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Jeff. This is a fabulous uh, uh, demo and walk walk through the uh, workflow. Uh, I don't know that I've ever heard about Cal and Mongolian language before. <laughs> so <laughs> degree of difficulty quite high. And those of you who have questions about um, uh, Ringtail and the Ringtail platform, I encourage you to reach out to the team at info at ringtail.com. Those of you who do have questions that uh, weren't answered today, uh, we'll make sure that your questions get answered uh, by the team. They'll reach back out to you. And um, the recording will be available. We'll be sending out a, a link to all of you. And thank you, um, Ringtail. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, thank you, Emily, for this fantastic session. And thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.